So it was a busy summer. No, I, it's it's okay. Um, I was just going to say, uh, can I? Um, their their drive is copied from particle accelerators. If you take a look at some of the particle oh, accelerators, yeah, yes, yeah, that's right. They kind of have this and they have the, they have the pancake shape, right. and they'll have multiple molds right. set up. And it also runs for particle accelerators. Um, they also run in what's called a TM. Uh, 010 mode, so that you can get your particles to accelerate. So, accelerate. so, so they copied that from that, but the only way it really did work was to turn around and put the dielectric slug into it. That is correct. So you create an asymmetry. Mm -hmm. All right, this is a typical output from a console. Uh, Frank Davies looked at the, I did a photo analysis of Shawyer's second generation dynamic test article. That's where I came up with the dimensions, you know, 11, six and a quarter, nine inch. And then we had Frank model this, uh, varying the small end of the cavity, just to look at the resonant modes and the resonant frequencies. And uh, versus the very, you know, very pointy end versus a cylinder. And we basically just said, uh, we'll just end up in the middle. So this is what we built. Uh, next slide. Hey, Paul. Oh yeah, sir. Quick question. Did you, are these modeled with or without a dielectric? This was modeled without a dielectric. That's an empty cavity. The, the, when you put a dielectric slug in the cavity, basically what it does electrically like this is just downshift all the resonances a certain percentage. So with, like with, um, with a TE012 resonant mode, it expressed in the cavity we built at 2167 megahertz. When we put the two dial PE discs in at the small end of the cavity, it downshifted to 1880 megahertz. And the quality factor was reduced appropriately, uh, depending on the quality factor, the loss factors in the PE. PE is not very lossy, so the quality factor went from 40,000 to 20,000, something on that order. Uh, these are the three uh, room temperature prototypes that Shaw you built. This is his test, first test article with a ceramic uh, dielectric insert at the bottom. He got 16 millinewtons out of this one, supposedly. Uh, this one is his dynamic test article that was on a rotary test program, a uh, rotary test platform, uh, but in air. And uh, this unit supposedly was on the order of, uh, what was that? Around 300 millinewtons, supposedly. And this is his third test article. These were both at 2.45 gigahertz. And this test article was at 3.85 gigahertz. This is the one he sent to Boeing. And uh, his, his data, thrust data, indicated something on the order of uh, 200 to 400 millinewtons with um, up to about 400 watts, if I remember wrong. He was using a, a, a traveling wave tube drive, narrow band. He went from wide band, magnetrons are notoriously noisy and wide bandwidth. They typically plus minus like 30 megahertz on, on the center frequency. Whereas the uh, TW, the, the traveling wave tube that he used for this unit is a narrow band, you know, within a few uh, tens of kilohertz or less. Yes, sir. Uh, do you notice if there's any difference in the um, heat dissipation, but whether or not you have a dielectric in there or not? At the power levels we're looking at, Greg, no. You didn't know you hadn't looked at it, or no, there's no, no, no there's No, there is. I've done IR studies of our cavity. You know, it, the cavity, the dielectric does warm up, but really what warms up is at the ends here. What well, depends on where the mode is. Yeah. It's stir current. It, and depend, it, we use a TM212 mode that has stir currents down here at the big end. And that's where the, uh, the, the, uh, the shell heats up. And I'll show you that in a little bit. But like you said, the, the heat is proportional to the Q. And you said that the, the Q went down from 40,000 with no dielectric to, to 20,000 20, with dielectric. Yes. So that means that, that there, sh there should be a proportional amount of greater heat being dissipated in the dielectric. Yeah, it's getting absorbed by the dielectric. Sure, exactly. Okay. And will be re-radiated as I are. Yes. It's maybe a dumb question, but does it make any difference where that feed board is? Yes. It does? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, 
initially we started out, you know, it was down here. It turns out where the optimum place to put the feed is in the middle. So it echoes. You have equal distance from the antenna, the both end plates. Otherwise, you get into destructive interference between the wave fronts. <laughs> By the way, also, we found out later that this test article, Shawyer used flat end caps. This, end, this test article, his second gen and everything forward, use spherical end caps. The spherical end caps, and they're meshed this way. They're shaped this way, and then shaped that way. Um, that's right. And so you basically have, par you, you have made the, the RF wave fronts back and forth. <laughs> you have made the wave fronts parallel bouncing back and forth on, on the sphere, sphere, spherical end mirrors. It's basically kind of like an optical telescope. Why did you make the change? Because the E-field levels go up by a factor of 5 to 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's so the factor, with this cavity right here, from my, my calculations, his E-field e level for a given power input went up by a factor of 5 for the same power level. And if the effect seems to scale with the E to the th third or fourth power, that's huge. That's why he's getting millinewtons or tens of hundreds of millinewtons, and we're getting micronewtons. Okay, next slide. This was his test article. He just published, uh, sorry, uh, Roger Shawyer just published this, this particular re test report on his M drive test, uh, test uh, excuse me, uh, website. And uh, these, he was averaging at, uh, I believe, about 300 watts, about uh, 15 to 20 millinewtons uh, with this test article. He enclosed it, nested it. He had to have the fan running for the mag magnetron. And so he had his air circulation in a secondary EMI shield. And then he would you know, flip the whole box, flip the whole box, left, up, down, and sideways. This is in air then? That was in air. That is correct. As far as I know, Greg, he's never reported any, Shawyer has never reported in vacuum testing. But inside the frost room is vacuum. It's no, 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 it's in oh, air. Really? It's in air. Oh, it's in air. <laughs> So that's uh, dielectric in itself. Uh, yes, but compared to his dielect. Yeah, it's the same. It's yeah, it's another element, an uncontrolled known, unknown. So is it vented in then at no. all, or is it just no, no. sealed up? He sealed it because he did not want uh, heat plumes coming off of it to disturb his, his force measurements. So you have a limited lifetime as far as runtime. This whole box starts getting warmer as you're running it, and then you have to stop at some point uh, when it gets to a certain temperature. And then you have to let everything cool down. So if you have a buoyancy effect, uh, heat? Yes, there is a buoyancy effect. And if you notice, Jose, uh, there's a green line right here and a red line. This is the difference between the buoyancy. He, he, he knew about the buoyancy and took it into account. Interesting yes. just to hang a microwave on there, a microwave oven, and see if he gets the same result. Well, this is a microwave oven. Right, that's so what I'm saying. Just take a Sears microwave oven and hang it on there and see if he gets the same results. Uh, I don't think he did. <laughs> uh, who, who had a question? Somebody back. Yes, Michelle. Yeah. Um, Scheuer did uh, take into effect the, the thermal plumbing or the ballooning of the thrust room on that. Um, if you have thrust in one direction, all you have to do is rotate your device 180 degrees, right. and then you can subtract them out. Because, exactly. And because the buoyancy effect will be the same whether it's the thrust effect. It, it adds or subtracts. Or Correct. And that's what these plots you show. You can also here. turn around, you can also turn around and, right. and but he did rotate three, at 90 degrees too. This is a kind of a data summary, you know, forward, reverse, Null, forward, reverse, null, forward, nurse, null. Is that a valid statement considering there's air in there, an asymmetrical chamber? You could end up with stratification on, the, on your atmospherics and so your buoyant center points you may not be. It's air, it's not going to stratify because there's a circulation fan keeping it circulating. In, in one inside section of it, inside the frust room, there's none. No, no, inside the frust room, no, agreed. And it, it takes several degrees difference to start any circulation. But again, look at the differences in the buoyancy effects. We're talking maybe a millinewton for the buoyancy, and we're talking 20 millinewtons for the thrust signature. I'm just saying it may not be completely negated because of the asymmetry. Agreed. Next slide. 
Okay, this is Shawyer's uh, uh, dynamic unit. He had that second generation unit on a rotary test bed, again in air. And these are the force pulses that he was claiming, something on the order of 54 to, uh, what was it, 96 millinewtons for the test he demonstrated uh, with 334 watts of power, 0.287 newtons per kilowatt is his claim. <sighs> Next slide. This is his third generation unit, the one he sent to Boeing, though that Boeing paid for, uh, using a traveling wave tube system and a closed uh, RF uh, tuning circuit that allowed it to track the, these cavities, when they warm up, the cavities get bigger and therefore the resonant frequency decreases. It's, it's proportional to the volume. And uh, so that's what, oh, and somewhat like Jim's PZT stacks, when they warm up, the frequency goes down. And so these cavities have the same problem, uh, and you have to have the same time of tracking electronics to keep it on resonance. Uh, if the, uh, yeah, uh, I'll get to it in a moment. All right, uh, and this unit was 0.326 newtons per kilowatt. It was millinewtons. I think peak was almost 180 millinewtons for about 400 watts input. Okay. Any questions here? I think the Boeing results said they got nothing. That's what Jamie said. Jamie Childress. Okay. Right. I thought that's I thought that's what you were showing. This is no. This okay. is this is this is Shawyer's end when he sent when he tested. Oh, what he sent to Boeing. That what he sent to Boeing. And I know what Jamie told Sonny was that they could never get this thing to resonate. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> I leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, EW Copper Frustrum Build-Up Project was started October 2013. Uh, it was done by three of us, Tim Lawrence, myself, and Tim Lawrence's dad, who has a, a bending mandrel that, that actually rolled the copper for the, uh, the, the nozzle. Uh, we built, again, we built one based uh, as closely on the geometry of uh, Shawyer's second generation uh, M drive. And then uh, during the summer, spring and summer of 2014, we explored how to use the thing. Uh, next slide. This is the test article that we built. Uh, this is on the dining room table in my house that my darling wife, Sue, allowed me to use and has continued to allow me to use as my workbench. <laughs> uh, but I promised her I'm moving out soon. Not <laughs> you, just the stuff. Just the stuff. <laughs> Clear it out! Anyway, uh, I use flat uh, end plates, on the, small and end plates, but I use printed circuit board a single layer printed circuit board, primarily because it was easy to do. I had the material, but I also had thoughts of looking at using an IR camera uh, on the end place to look at modal uh, heating. And that way you could verify what mode it was actually oscillating in, what the RF resonance was from the heating pattern. Next slide. Paul, yes. you use what material on the end? Uh, FR4 printed <laughs> circuit board, uh, one ounce copper on the inside. Okay, so you could then build a out of PC board, copper covered PC board, yeah. an entire frost room instead of going. You could the if cone. you want to roll for the cone. The cone well, would be harder. Or you square off, square it up. There'd right. be more. Oh, oh, oh! You're talking about what ja like Jamie built? Right. Uh, that's flat, flat cell trapezoid. Right. Yes, surely. Uh, this is a cross section. Like I'm sorry. Oh yes. After the copper, what we did, uh, copper oxidizes in air, of course, especially in Houston air with all the humidity we've got. Uh, so after we uh, formed up the, the, the copper, we polished it, buffed it out, typical like you would do for car polishing, and then we applied a coat of uh, silicone uh, conformal coating. Uh, it's a CNG chemical, uh, has a, a spray bottle that, uh, that you, you spray on a thin layer and then you bake it for about an hour and a half at 150 degrees F in, a, uh, in an oven. And that has worked very well, Martin. It keeps it from oxidizing. We've been using this cavity, this uh, frustum for about two years now, and the interior is still pretty, almost pristine. 
except where I've been screwing around with the antenna. Okay, uh, again, PC boards on the ends, FR4, uh, single layer, one ounce copper. Uh, the material was 024 copper sheet. Uh, I think it was alloy 110. Not the best alloy, but again, that was what, what the, uh, Tim's dad had available. I built the, uh, the, the flanges out of uh, alloy 101 uh, using a router, and that's what made the, uh, back up one, plate, one, one slide, please. You see these, these copper, uh, these are basically strengthening rings and uh, struts. And uh, I, I built these out of uh, copper sheet with a router, just routed out the rings. Uh, what else? How did you attach them to this? How did you attach those support structures? Solder. Oh, just solder? Just solder. Just uh, common uh, 6040 lead alloy uh, solder with a torch. Worked pretty well too, actually. Next, back up. Okay, here's the polyethylene disc. We, I did one test without the discs, and I didn't realize what I had. It was the first test, and I thought that I was supposed to be seeing millinewtons at the time, TE012, just like Shawyer, and I didn't think I was seeing anything but noise. But on the next uh, couple of slides down, I'll, I'll show that because I had the calibrations, uh, I normally run the calibration uh, pulses with 200 volts or 300 volt, which is either 29 or 65 micronewtons. This time it was 500 volts and it was like 180 micronewtons. And it, the interpretation of the slide was a bit different, but I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, again, this is mounted on, uh, this is the, the cross section of the aluminum bar that's the torque pendulum arm. And uh, we just had it uh, bolted up to that. Okay, so this is our test article as we've been using it for most of the time. Had a 14.8 degree uh, cone slope. And what else? That's about it. Oh, total weight about 20. Uh, the, the, the cavity without the polyethylene was 1.6 kilograms. With the polyethylene, it was 2.57 kilograms. How'd you fix the polyethylene to the bolts? Uh, it was Teflon bolt. Initially, it was nylon bolts. I found that nylon and RF don't agree very well. Uh, nylon heats up pretty badly if you get a mode shape where the uh, RF is expressed at the little end. Uh, so we, I moved over to uh, Teflon and polypropylene, which worked very well. And I, I just uh, counter, I, I tapped the polyethylene and I just uh, used uh, cap screws. Next slide. Question. Sure. Um, did you uh, put your Teflon, did you put a piece of Teflon tape uh, around your screw so when you sealed it in? Yes. Okay. That helped. It helped. It, on the nylons. Yes. But the best solution was get rid of the nylon, got to pull polypropylene. Polypropylene is almost as strong or almost as strong as nylon and its RF losses is very much akin to uh, polyethylene and Teflon. Or ceramic. Or, or ceramic. ceramic screws. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay, this was the poly, polyethylene. I ended up, I tried, I had uh, six uh, and, a, and an eighth diameter by one inch and, an, and a sixteenth thick polyethylene di bricks or discs. I tried one, two, and three discs. The optimum seemed to be two, so that's why I ended up with two for thrust production. Okay, next slide. Oh. These are the, uh, what we excite the RF in the cavity. These are magnetic loop antennas. And depending on what mode you're trying to excite, uh, a half a millimeter makes all the worlds uh, of difference in the, in the sizing. So that's why I threw that. I thought that's rather interesting. It only takes a half a millimeter <clears throat> difference. Next slide. Good question. Sure. How far into the first room does it go? Then? Is that on the edge? Okay, it's, well, it's right here. The, where I mounted ours was uh, about 15% up from the bottom, from the big OD end. It was, this is 14 millimeters, so as far as how far it goes into the cavity is gonna be you know, half of that, the, the center point of the, of the loop. Have you tried one in the dead center of the cavity? I have not, but I am going to try one. Uh, that's what Michelle and I have been working on a little bit having a, a loop antenna that comes from the small end down into the center 
It depends on what mode you're trying to excite, Jeremy. Uh, if you're exciting TE01 modes that have uh, E-field donuts wrapped around with magnetic toroids, then a loop down the center, you know, in the center, horizontal, and then you, you raise and lower the uh, antenna to, to uh, get the appropriate impedance match. Uh, oh, this is a TE01, you were talking about modal shapes. Uh, this is uh, for our cavity, you know, for the frustrum size we have. Uh, we have electric field is the red arrows that are horizontal whirlwind like this. And of course, around those is a toroidal magnetic field. Uh, again, Maxwell's equations, you know, the, the E field begets the B field, blah, 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 blah. And then there's two of those pancakes, or rather donuts, uh, a, a more intense one here and a, a less intense but larger one down here. And that's what the two mode tells you. So there's there two, would be a one mode. There would be one mode, a two mode, a three mode, a four mode, a five mode. <laughs> there's a whole... You can think of them as stacks of torque. Yes, right? yes. <clears throat> For the TE. TM's a little different. Mm. Uh, okay. Next, uh, the TE, TM is that fundamental that you were talking about? Yes, the TM010 mode is just where the electric fields uh, go from the side Let's see here. Go from the sides here. The electric fields go this way. And then the magnetic field is at the bottom, and it's a circular arrangement. That's the TM010 mode. And there are literally near infinite number of modes that are capable of being expressed in an open cavity. That's one of the problems that make them kind of hard to control. But so which mode do you, have you guys settled on? I mean, you mentioned your earlier but I didn't catch. I haven't really settled. TM has its advantages. It appears from the other people's work that the TE modes, like Shawyer only uses TE mode. TE012 or TE013. What is the uh, We need to have a more robust statement. In your uh, 2014 AIA uh, paper, right. uh, the mode shape like it's by far the best research, the best uh, force divided by input power is the transverse electric mode, just like uh, the other people do. And it's yet, yet uh, you uh, went on to only test from then on the transverse magnetic modes. So Jose, it, that's a tribute to my lack of skills in the RF field. I was manually tuning the system throughout most of this work. At the TE012 mode, had a quality factor of about 25,000-ish loaded. That the, 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 the bandwidth, therefore, was about, about 100 kilohertz or a little less, and I was trying to hand tune that frequency at uh, 1.88 gigahertz and I couldn't keep track of it as the, as the cavity expanded, and I was trying to manually trying to you know keep the uh, tuning of the VCO on that frequency the, 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 as it shifted, and it was damn I couldn't keep track of it well enough. So I went to the TM two uh, the TM two one two mode. Uh, first off, it seemed to produce a little more thrust with the with the dielectric in there with the with the PE discs, but it was also. Uh, the quality factor went from 20,000 to 7,000. And so the bandwidth opened up to about 380 kilohertz. And that was a lot easier to keep hold of as far as manually. So, so as far as uh, this tuning also, I'm not clear. Uh, do you still are manually tuning as you were in 2014? Or later test you change how you tune? I was manually tuning up to the time we got a phase lock loop system installed. And that alleviated some of it. But it wanted that mode lock on the PLL circuit wanted to hop from mode to mode, and I always was trying to chase it. So it, was, it turned out not to be the best way to go. The best way to go for tuning, by far, is the uh, min uh, VSWR minima tracker, where you're lo you have a uh, a du dual directional coupler, and you're looking at the reflected power output and you, tr you have a, an algorithm, a computer algorithm, that tunes uh, the VCO, the voltage control oscillator that drives the frequency to the RF amplifier, 
uh, to that VSWR minima, where you want to maximize your power injection into the cavity. So when did you start doing this uh, better uh, tracking? Uh, within the last six months. So it's, so it's not all of our, pre, uh, our 2014 and the 2016 paper at JPP was all either hand, manual tune for the 2014 or the phase lock loop tune for the um, 2016 paper that's coming so in. The last six months where you have this better tracking system, have you ever tested any other mold shape that TN2 no, no. no. I have been, we have locked configuration on our current config cavity and once I get out from under EW, I will. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you have a, uh, an illustration of 212? Yes. That's not six minutes. Yeah, it, it's coming. Okay. Uh, next slide. Oh, uh, let's see. We, during the March of spring of 2014, March explored a number of his fruster, uh, copper frustums RF resonant modes with and without dielectrics. Frequency range for the TE012 was 2167. Without the dielectric, it was 1880. With the dielectric, um, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Here's the TE012 mode. You see that there's an elect a very strong electric field in the top donut wrapped with a magnetic field. And then there's a weaker, ver a weaker version of same but larger in the lower portion of the frustrum. If this was a TE013 mode, it would have three of these donuts. What's the one for? The one is the modal It's the, it designates that it generates a, a, this donut shape. And the two, I'm sorry? They, they're using the, there is no convention on mode shape numbering for truncated cones, which have, truncated cones have the exact solution are spherical weights, which I actually that explains why Schroeder went to the, the spherical ends, right? The, this convention, T0, E012, for example, is only applicable to cylindrical cavities. Yeah. The, the first uh, number, zero, it has to do with the so-called azimuthal or with, with the cylindrical direction for a cylindrical cavity. The number you're looking for, which is the one, is in the in a cylindrical cavity, it would be the radial direction, but it's perpendicular to the cylindrical surface. And the, and the, last, the last number is in the axial direction. And that describes, again, how many donuts or whatnot you have. Re repetition of the pattern. Yeah. So, so the one means that you, if you have that, that, uh, those two, uh, is, the one is because it's from the center of the of the, of the cylinder to, to, the, to the face, there's only one uh, uh, weight button. Concentric toroids would be a two. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Next slide. This is the TE, when I, how I measure the, uh, the quality factor of the, of the cavity. You, get, you take an S21 plot on a vector network analyzer, uh, go down minus three dB from the peak, and measure the bandwidth accordingly. The, again, frequency on the, on the x-axis and uh, basically signal strength on the y-axis. And this was for the uh, 2167 megahertz quality factor of our ca copper cavity was 40,890. Okay, next slide. Now, this is, a calibra this is the uh, first calibration pulse I did with our test setup in this configuration. This was, a, again, I used an RF dummy load to see what the Lorentz forces from the 28 volt DC wiring. There, you know, we, have, I, we use twisted pair on everything to cancel out most of the Lorentz forces that would be generated between the DC f uh, currents and the Earth's magnetic field. And so, but we never got rid of all of it. So it's just a matter of you uh, do a, a cal run with a, a RF dummy load uh, that will show you, okay, and this particular wiring, every time you change the wiring configuration, you, you have to redo this. 
and you have to verify what your extraneous forces do to Lorentz forces are with the Earth's magnetic field. And in this case, it was 34 micronewtons or 35. Next slide. Uh, just a close-up of the dummy. This is a 100 watt, 50 ohm dummy load. Uh, you can buy it at your surplus store. This is where I got this one. And uh, it, the RF uh, amplifier and is, it was back here. And the DC power for it, same, is coming through the liquid metal contacts into the torque pendulum system and then over to the RF amp. Next slide. Okay, this is the first test I did with this copper cavity. It was at 2167, TE012 signal, no dielectric. And note what my Cal pulse was. It was, seven, it was a 500 volt, 7.7 .7 micron displacement, and that equates out to 182 micronewtons. I got the first signal was for about 20 seconds, and it was about minus 35 micronewtons. But when you include the 38 micronewtons going the opposite direction from uh, the uh, Lorentz force, that changes your baseline. And so you have to add the two and you end up with a minus 70 micronewtons to the right in this configuration. I did a second pulse and it was even a little larger. And I, I, I was thinking this is still at 29 micronewtons. And I said, oh, that's, that's just noise because I thought the 38 micronewtons, Lorentz force just canceled out what I was seeing. And I was wrong. Next slide. T012 frust room test without dielectric yield in an average minus 77. Minus, by the way, is towards the big end. It's not towards the small end. So depending on the mode you're, you're exercising, this is what I saw. So, so they, they, it was moving towards the big end. Big end. In T012, which had the uh, high density polyethylene at the small end. Is that correct? No polyethylene. They got no polyethylene. No, poly, no dielectric, no poly, this was an empty cavity. All that was in there was the copper and the silicone overcoat, conformal coat on the copper, you know, as an oxidation prevention. So that adds another element that might be interacting, that might be Jim's dielectric for all. Can you tell us though, you never got results with, without a dielectric? <sighs> in my initial uh, test report in 2014, that's what I thought I saw. But now you do see the results. Of I the had point. gone back and I realized because I misinterpreted a Cal pulse. I thought the Cal pulse was 29 micronewtons. It actually turned out to 187 micronewtons. And that changes. I thought the Lorentz force positive just canceled out the, uh, the negative pulse I saw. So I said, okay, just basically go. I, I didn't see anything. But once I realized that the Cal pulse was not what I thought it was, but 187 micronewtons, then the measurements what I, I took were reinterpreted. And I did that for this particular conference. Yes, sir. Can you, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on the Lawrence Force contribution that adds up to this? What do you mean exactly by that? Okay, okay. Martin. You've got a twisted pair wire coming from the liquid metal contacts going over to the RF amplifier. It has, a, for this amplifier, it was about 5.5 amps at 28 DC. Of course, if you had a single wire and then, come, and then going through a ground return, you would have a huge area in the loop that would interact with the Earth's magnetic field, have a torque. Most, all of the wiring I've done on this was either twisted or twisted shielded. So most of that area was reduced to a very small value, but I still ended up having uh, RF ground loops going through the structure to ground. And that way, the only way I could really account for that is to do a dummy test and, the, and then and for a given uh, power and current, DC current, that for a 5.5 amp DC current, I have an offset of with this wiring configuration. Okay, that's what you did with this big uh, capacitor before. Well, and it's not capacitor, it's an, uh, RF, sorry, yeah, it's an RF dummy load. Okay. It's a big resistor yeah. with a heat sink. Yeah. Okay, but let me uh, reconcile this. So, TE012 with no dielectric insert, you get a uh, uh, displacement towards the leak diameter. 
big diameter to the tune of about 70 micronewtons. But isn't, the, isn't it just the opposite of what Scheuer claims for this exactly the same mold shape? I can't, yes. It is, right? It's exactly the opposite. It is, it is opposite. I, I, I can't reconcile that. And I talked about Martin. And then Martin tested in uh, both mold shape. He, zero, one. <laughs> he don't know. <laughs> yeah, Michelle. Um, the one thing about the TE012 mode is it's very hard to establish that mode within the frustrum. Um, even though it'll give you a very high Q, it means its bandwidth is real tight. Also, because the electrical field is around the periphery of the, the cone, around the outside of the cone, that's where you start inducing most of your heat. So what will end up happening is that cone grows very quickly. And because of that thermal effect of that growing, you will change your, you will change the mode that it is in. You will change your end plate spacing between the two and your mode will drift on off. Or you may end up running a multi-mode if, you, if you've done it like you did in there where you put the loop on the sidewall <coughs> of the cavity. Right. You get an asymmetrical insert of RF into that. And then when you add the expansion of the cavity itself, changing the, the distance between the uh, end plates, uh, you have really no idea what you're going to end up going or doing. You have no stable environment there. Agreed. And, and this is a... It's, 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 it says that you had something happening, some kind of effect happening. Uh, to the result of such And it may not, as you say, it might, might, might not have been TE012, it might have been a combination mode, set of modes, uh, because there were some modes around the TE012. There always is. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, you, and your antenna design can favor or, or not favor them. Lock in a mode with your so antenna So isn't this a problem for all the people testing here and drive, that uh, they, they don't really know what the mode shape it, it is because uh, you don't have any experimental probe to actually test what is the actual mode shape. Because Agreed. one thing is the model, uh, so you know, that's right, right? That I, I believe you're correct. Okay. That unless you certify, we were lucky, we found that the TM212 mode had a distinct pattern. You're the only one that's right. And uh, that we, f we verified that with the IR scans. Right. Okay, next slide. So take this with a grain of salt. This is what, we, okay. When I added the dielectric, the first off, the, what appeared to be what I had negative going towards the large end, now the thrust vector flipped the other way. But again, the Lorentz force for this wiring setup was subtracting from the signal, not adding. So it ended up being about 37 micronewtons. Sorry, Paul. Were these tests performing in vacuum or in air? This is all in air. Okay. We'd, our 2014, uh, and early 2015 work was all in air because we did not have the RF amplifier that could go in vacuum. We did not get the money for that, which was a $5,800 pop uh, until the summer of 2015. Okay, next slide. Uh, time was still using Mark I eyeball tuning. This is a description of what I gave with, uh, uh, oh, let's see here. Jose, yeah, I, Jose already asked this question. And that's Mark One Eyeball. We didn't really, this is why we, I settled on the TM212 mode, was because I could control, the bandwidth was on the order of a 314 kilohertz, and I could control it manually. That's all that says. Next slide. How much can the size really change thermally? It must be very small. It, yes. <laughs> But, yes. But this can be modeled with uh, console. Actually, that's one of the things that the uh, console, console does well. Uh, what the size cavity, the cavity can change on the order of about 10 to 20 microns in length, depending on the power levels. That's enough to change the resonant frequency. Oh my God, yes. At least one to two megahertz. Yeah. And remember, with a bandwidth of 300 kilohertz, if your RF signal is sitting here at 50 kilohertz, it can, it can accommodate some shift, but it will be out of there pretty quickly. So 10 microns changes it by how much did you say? 10 about, megahertz? Uh, about two. Two, two megahertz. Two megahertz. Hey, Paul. Yes. You said it changes the length of the pole? Uh, it, it, the, the diameter? 
and the length. Um, but how does that affect end caps? Because they'll bow. Uh, a little, but not. It didn't seem to be a major problem. And do you notice any uh, EM induced vibration in the freshman itself? No. Have you been looking for it? Yeah. No. The the uh, the the mass of the material is such a large low pass filter. It can respond to kilohertz level vibrations, not gigahertz level. Uh, this is the TM212 resonant mode. It has four tornadoes right down here, a magnetic electric, uh, this is, mag again, blue is magnetic, oops, blue is magnetic, uh, red is electric, and there's four little volcanoes that basically come up to the sidewall, and then there's another set that's set, flipped by uh, 90 degrees right by the sidewall. And again, this is the IR, the stir current heating. This is a, I'm getting out of the way. Um, this is the electric field intensity for each of the four donuts, or four toroids, four tornadoes. Uh, but you notice up here in the dielectric, there, it, it is echoed a little bit for the same type of thing, but at a much weaker level. And at the big end, very strong heating. At the little end, in the dielectric and on the end caps, a little bit of stir currents, but much, it's reduced by a factor of 10. So the electric field's not going to zero at the end cap because of the dielectric thing? Yes. There's a, so there's a normal pump. There is a normal the component there. There has to be. Yes, sir? Is this a thermal camera picture or is it a simulation on the right? What, this? That's an IR camera picture. Is real? Click, 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 click. That was me. Okay. We have an IR hand camera in the lab that was bought to do this kind of uh, analysis work. And. Uh, Jose was very happy that I did that. <laughs> you have a much better uh, comparison where you show your IR camera with the calculations from console. Do you have that slide? Uh, not, uh, um, I, have a, uh, I have it in my thumb drive. I don't have it on this. That's an excellent comparison between the measurement and calculation. That was another five or six pages if I remember right. Okay, next slide. Here's the end caps again enlarged on the IR camera uh, showing the, the hot spots. Uh, on the electric, where the higher, highest I squared R losses were for this mode, for the TM212 mode, that's the pattern it generates when the antenna is mounted right there. It's pinned to the antenna location. If I rotated the antenna 90 degree, this pattern would rotate 90 degrees. And then this is, again, you can see on the little end that the uh, stir currents up there are much, much weaker, but still there, like I say, about an order of magnitude down from the big ones. Next slide, uh, this is the force peak. Again, this configuration had the, this is in air, first off. Uh, the mini circuits RF amplifier was mounted on the back side of the torque pendulum as a counterbalance for the test article. So the advantage to that, oh God, is it already? Okay, <laughs> time flies for me. 10 or 15 to wrap. Okay, fine. All right, good God, I'm gonna to have to jump way ahead. Uh, I'm only on slide 48. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we saw this is an average of about 100 micronewtons. Uh, and again, you can tell, you start seeing artifacts, the thermal artifacts that we spent all of the 2016 paper on evaluating and analyzing. Uh, that was the biggest complaint from the JPP editors and uh, reviewers was what is our torque pendulum doing when you have center of gravity shifts in the, as the cavity expands, that twists the torque pendulum and makes it move. We had to quantify that, qualify it and quantify it. And that's most of what the paper is about. And, and then separate it out from the force calculations, which we did, but there's still a force there. Next slide. Say, hey, Paul. Yes. Uh, it was a couple of slides back, and maybe I just kind of woke up, but uh, the, the, you mentioned the volcanoes. Uh, and and uh, the TNC was in modal side. Yeah, right, right. And uh, it, it's kind of sound like to me like vorticity. Vorticity, it's, but you have a vacuum. So is it electromagnetic vorticity? Is, I mean, yes. is that what you're saying? Yes. And does it change very much, or I mean, time, or what happens? It, it builds and, and falls. You know, this is an E&M. In electromagnetics, Wes, as you know, 
the electric field builds up, and then the magnetic field collapses while the E field is building, and then they swap back and forth. One begets the other. Okay. And so yes, they're always changing uh, over a RF cycle. At uh, an RF cycle at this level is on the order of uh, 10 nanoseconds or something on that order. And uh, so over that time period, is it more like one nanosecond? This is gigahertz, Paul. Um, so over that time, over a, a one nanosecond period, the RF rises and falls uh, over 360 degrees, and that whole pattern uh, creates and falls and creates over th over that time period, and then repeat as required. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Now I was never happy with the uh, calibration. A noise, or rather, excuse me, the baseline noise from our vibration environment and where we're located. I have air handlers on one side and an elevator on the other. It is what it is. It's what the space they gave us. Uh, so anywho, I changed the magnetic damper design to first off uh, enclose the magnetic damper in a uh, quarter inch thick iron uh, tube to pretty much shield the uh, other areas from any extraneous B fields. And uh, I added one more neodymium iron boron magnet and then substituted aluminum, uh, rather copper for aluminum. And that greatly enhanced my damping coefficients that I actually got rid of most of my baseline noise. So that was what this is, as my, what I call my second gen magnetic damper. Next, next slide. Uh, this was a forward reverse uh, in air run in December 2014. This is not published. Uh, this was the forward, this is the reverse. And we had an ace, the way, when we swapped the test article from forward to reverse, the cabling had to swap with it because the antenna was on one location. I didn't symmetrically place it at the top, which I should have. Oh well. 2020 hindsight. Um, but because of that swapping, the, the center of gravity of the torque pendulum changed. Mm -hmm. And it generated an asymmetry in the response when I changed the force from you know, this way versus that way. And that's why this is the reverse thrust pulse for this forward one. And again, CalPUS front end, CalPUS uh, rear end, just to show you what the dynamic. And this slope change right here is the thermal energy injected into the system and into the torque bearings that make it start, you know, the baseline start drifting down or to the left. Next slide. Now this is one again in air. Uh, no, this is in vacuum. Uh, we finally had our, our RF amplifier. It wasn't 2012. That was our first one, okay, sorry. Uh, 50 watt, 9.8 amps on the DC, Q of 6700. This is TM212 again, uh, it, with two dielectric discs. You can tell when I have dielectric discs and the end caps, you can see the bolts right here. And there was four bolts holding the polyethylene to the small end cap. Uh, and counterbalance weights, and there, we were seeing somewhere between 50 and 78. I think most of this is center of balance artifacts, especially you can tell from the slope. The prob slope right here is a good 50 micronewtons before it starts, the, the torque pendulum uh, thermal effects start taking hold. And again, you can see from straight baseline pretty much to a, yeah, there are my thermal drifts showing up. Never ended. Next slide. Uh, this is reverse. Uh, again in vacuum, 3.7 you know, times 10 to the minus 6 tor, uh, and 1702, 17, yeah, it was the same, during the same pump down. This is when our RF amplifier started failing. It turned out that EM Power's hermetically sealed RF amplifier wasn't, it, it was sort of sealed. And it had leaked down uh, from atmospheric to about one tor. Oh, what happens at one tour? You glow discharge all over. <laughs> and after I, 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 we failed the box, and... Uh, Did you keep the receipt? <laughs> <laughs> no, EM Power was, actually repaired that one for free. One. <laughs> That's all. So you did. <laughs> we did keep the receipt. That was about a $1,500 repair bill if we hadn't. Uh, but 
I, while it was failing, that's why this power level is so low. Uh, I, the mass I could get was about one to three watts, but I did see a nice clean prompt negative going thrust pulse and a positive going thrust pulse. Okay, next. Oh God, this is a, a, a you'll see this in the in the uh, JPP paper where we did uh, thermal analysis where we superimposed an impulsive uh, force uh, with a thermal bias on the torque pendulum. And this is basically what you end up getting, the, sh the total shape. So that's, that's gone into gory detail for 32 pages. Next slide. <laughs> Put you to sleep. This is the, in our 20, uh, on our December 2014 date, we, we tested at 30, 40, 50, and 60 watts. Our average thrust level is about uh, 55 micronewtons at 50 watts. Next slide. Uh, during the latter part of the summer of 2015, we got a new vacuum pump. There's a $22,000 piece of hardware right there uh, that helped pump down. Instead of taking three days to pump down, this would allow us to pump down in about four hours. Very handy, but it's costly. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, first outside EW Lab republished in 24 JPC. Uh, blue ribbon panel was in July, right? Eight PhDs. Basically, they were asked Dr. Wright to evaluate his QVC code. Their conclusions were they thought our QV was either profound or just a mathematical coincidence. <laughs> uh, they were less critical of our experimental program. In August 2014, Sonny went to the, uh, maybe I've got this reverse. You said uh, Jason's was in June? Jason was in June. All right, so I need to correct that. So, but anyway, uh, they didn't like his QVC conjecture. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, uh, let's see, we published the dynamics of the vacuum about that time. Sonny published another paper. Uh, com. So, oh, 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 same time period. Sonny came up with a bottoms up quantum vacuum plasma code. Uh, based on a 3D array of little uh, cubes in the cavity. So you can model that, what happened in each little cube for the RF field and how the quantum vacuum might respond to that if it was mutable and degradable. Where did you publish those papers? Uh, those are, oh, I'll give you a list. I forgot the damn publications. They aren't high rise. Not like, not like uh, or not, no, 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 no. Next paper, uh, let's see, uh, next slide, I think, or is that M. John Series? I found me on the top, um, that's all. Next slide. Okay, this is what Sonny's quantum vacuum code generated on a time step. And each one of these red and white dots is considered an EP pair, electron positron pair in the, in the Dirac C. That's his basic model. And the, the, in this model, instead of the dielectric providing a, um, an electrostrictive effect, uh, as w uh, Dr. Woodward's uh, model would use it for, it acts like an, a, a plasma mirror. And it sends the plasma, the QV plasma, it reflects it back in the same direction as the main thrust. So that's why Sonny's model indicates the, you know, the, the thrust in, increased or changed direction. Uh, next slide. Oh, again, this is a, the same quantum vacuum code and you can see the pattern established that is generated from the COMSOL RF uh, TM212 simulation, emulation. Next slide. Uh, that's the, the, the QV plasma code predictions. It predicted about 54 micronewtons. Next slide. And we saw about 50 micronewtons thereabouts. So that was fairly close for, for one test for one power level. Doesn't say anything really, it's just one test. Next slide. During the winter of 2014, performed in vacuum test runs, split copper, uh, generated very clean thrust pulses in one direction, but almost non-existent thrust pulses in the other. And again, that was due to the RF cabling asymmetries in the uh, center of gravity shifting. Next slide. Oh, well, you should probably bring it in for a landing. I'm not sure. 
what you've got here. I've got the whole work from 26, all the t stuff that went into 2016. Uh, Pace through that, I want to get, I want, just next slide. There's, there's our backup one. There's our current test art. We integrated everything onto the test article. That way, all the RF cabling remained the same when you swapped it around. And so that's what we're currently running. Next slide. Those are the cow pulses for that configuration. Next slide. Again, tuning. Next slide. I'm sorry. There's the test article set up. Again, towards the small end. This is TM212 mode. And uh, next slide. Ah, here we go. This is in vacuum, uh, 5.8 times 10 to the minus 5 tor. And uh, we had a thrust pulse of about 105 micronewtons, but a large CG uh, shift in the center of gravity on the, on the torque beam. Um, but again, we go into all the glory details in the report. But, but okay, next, next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide. That's, the, uh, that's reverse, sorry, back up. Right, hold it right there. Okay. This is in the reverse mode. This is what we saw all the time. As you see, we got a, a clean reversal in the thrust signature and a negative going or down instead of up and with thermal artifacts. And again, in that 50 to 100 micronewton level. And that's about that. Well, uh, you know, we might have a chance to follow up if you had some other stuff in the evening sessions or early in the morning. So maybe we better. Very good. Morning, if you start a little early, you can actually finish up the rest of the slides. Okay. Yeah, that'd be cool. There's only, well, that's another 15 to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thanks a lot. All right. It's Martin's turn. Yeah, let's take a 10 minute break.